Jeremy Fink and the Meaning of Life, Chapter 10. Oswald Oswald. Lizzie and I don't speak much on the way home. She's still fuming over the fuming over the details Mr. Oswald forgot to tell us. So I spend the time preparing what I'm going to tell Mom. I know I can't tell her everything, at least not until I understand what really happened and what I think about it. As I push open our front door, the smell of curry fills my nose. That means Aunt Judy is over making one of her exotic dishes. Mom and Aunt Judy pounce when they hear me. So, they ask in unison, wiping their hands on matching aprons, how was it? I hear you were whisked, whisked away in a limo, Aunt Judy says. My research speech comes out in a flood of words. The limo was amazing. There was a soda and a TV. Mr. Oswald was really nice. James, the driver, drove us up to our first delivery. It was a book to this lady on the Upper East Side. She was nice too. That's about it. Is it okay if I go to my room? By the time I finish my speech, I'm a bit breathless. Aunt Judy's smile is still wide, but my mom's has started to slip a bit at the edges. Ten minutes till dinner, she says, giving me a long look, but she lets me go. I empty my backpack on the bed and search through the contents to find the envelope. It's not here. I feel panic rising in me until I remember I'd stuck it in my pocket. The letter is yellowed and frayed, but when I unfold it, the type is still legible. No computer made this, that's for sure. There are smudges of ink and the letters don't always line up. It was definitely made on one of those old typewriters where you'd hit a key and a metal spring with a letter on the end would fly out and strike the paper. Grandma still has one, but whenever I try to use it, the key is jammed together. Leaning, leaning against the wall that I share with Lizzie's room, I begin to read. Oswald's Pawn Emporium, date March 31st, 1935, name Mabel Parsons, age 15 and three fourths, location Brooklyn. Item to pawn, Winnie the Pooh, signed by the author. Personal statement of seller. I need to sell this book because I need to buy a dress for the little cuddlition because my parents can't afford to buy me a new one and I'd have to wear my sister Janie's old one, but it is much too large and I would swim in it and no one will ask me to dance if no one asks me to dance. I may never get married and this may be my only chance. I desperately do not want to be an old maid like my great aunt Sylvia, who always says that she'd never be married because she never had the right clothes. Please don't tell my parents. A black and white photo is taped below the personal statement. It is surprisingly good condition for all this time. A girl in a polka dotted dress and a ponytail is holding a book up in front of her. The cover has a picture of a bear on it, but with its head stuck in a honey jar. I try to see if I can find Mabel in the girl's face, but I can't. Then I notice around her neck it's that same necklace with the two hearts. I had assumed her husband had given it to her, but she must have had it before she met him. Young Mabel's eyes are focused slightly to the side of the camera and her expression is firm. Under the photo it says, Price, $20, signed by Oswald Oswald, Appropriator. Oswald Oswald? Who would name their child Oswald Oswald? That's just insane. So it appears that my Mr. Oswald must have inherited the book from his grandfather. But why would he have us return it now? Why didn't old Ozzy sell it? Isn't that what pawnbrokers do? Mom knocks on, the, on my door. Five minutes, she says, but doesn't come in. I take another long look at the letter and then carefully roll it up and stick it in the tube for Lizzie. I can't explain why I don't want to tell my mom the details about what happened today. I feel like it would be disloyal somehow to Miss Bingsley and to 15-year-old Mabel. I grab the dictionary off my shelf and look up the word coddlition. It means a formal ball which often introduces young women to society. I smile to myself, picturing Lizzie being introduced to society. At dinner, I don't talk much. Mom and Aunt Judy discuss an exhibit of outside art, which my aunt is hosting at her school next week. Mom says I thought the whole idea of outside art meant these artists aren't interested in things like galleries or schools or museums. Scooping curried chicken and rice onto her plate, Aunt Judy says, it's true that these artists are on the fringe of society, so to speak, but without an exhibit, they have no voice. Maybe they don't want a voice, Mom argues. Maybe they just do it for their own pleasure. I now officially tune out. This is a common argument between the two of them. Mom thinks that art is a personal thing, and Aunt Judy believes that art isn't art until it's appreciated by the public. I have no opinion. I do not understand art. Mom says I will when I'm older. The curry smell has permeated the apartment to the degree that my dinner-sized double-decker peanut butter sandwich tastes a little odd. Not bad, exactly. Just different. I think this is a positive step for me. That night during HOJ, I take out the notebook that Officer Polinsky hands us. I open it to the first page, and it feels like the first day of school. 
I admit, I like a blank notebook. It's the best part of school. By the second day, I'm over it. A skilled recapper like myself should have no problem with this. Still, I find myself gnawing on my pencil top. The metallic, sawdusty taste isn't entirely unpleasant. I bend over my notebook and begin to write. Community service day one. Observations. One. I can get used to riding in a limo. People think limos are only for movie stars and politicians and athletes, but they are wrong. Two. Lizzie does not always share. Case in point. Starburst. Three. Mr. Oswald didn't exactly lie to us about what we'd been doing, but he didn't exactly not lie either. I am not sure why. I chew on the pencil again and glance at all the books piled on my bookshelf. I haven't had time to read ever since the box arrived. This must be a record for me. Suddenly it dawns on me that I didn't see any books in Miss Bingsley's apartment. Did Miss Bingsley give up her love of books because of losing her friend? She said she met her husband at dance and she seems to miss him. I wonder if that means she was happy with her decision to sell the book. 4. There must be two types of choices. Choices you make that seem harmless but can wind up leading to someone's father dying, like deciding to have one more cup of coffee that morning so you need to go out and buy more and then you cross the street without looking and make an oncoming car swerve into a telephone pole to avoid hitting you. And the other kind, when you know that you're doing will lead to something either bad or good, or in Miss Bingsley's case, both. She lost her friend, but she found her husband. 5. It's a good thing I make very few decisions in my life. What if I decide one day to eat three Butterfingers instead of two, and it led to war with Canada? As I close the notebook, I wonder if it's not too late for Miss Mingsley to have her friend back. What if Bitsy is missing her too? With six minutes left to the HOJ, I turn the internet and type in the words Bitsy Solomon and Brooklyn. I know it's a long shot, but how many Bitsy Solomons can there be from Brooklyn? Only one, as it turns out. 5-12-2002, funeral services will be held for Bitsy Solomon Schultz at the Brooklyn Memorial Chapel at 10 a.m. on Sunday, December 8th. In lieu of flowers, please consider making a contribution to the Double Heart Literacy Foundation. Miss Schultz started the DHL Foundation in 1950 in honor of a childhood friend who ignited her lifelong love of reading. She served as honorary chairwoman from 1989 to 2002. My grand plan of showing up at Miss Bingsley's door with Bitsy's phone number is clearly not going to happen. I scroll down until I see a photo. She sort of looks like my grandmother, and around her neck is the same double heart necklace that Miss Bingsley was wearing. I open my notebook again and add three more entries. 8. Some choices are forever. 9. I wonder if Miss Bingsley knew that Bitsy named her company after the matching necklaces they both wore. 10. Just because people aren't in our lives anymore doesn't mean they stop thinking about us, and vice versa. I climb into bed and grab the stuffed alligator, sometimes tight. Sometimes the internet tells you more than you want to know. Lizzie still isn't downstairs by the time James arrives to pick us up. I toss my bag onto the seat and promise James that it'll only be a minute. Out of breath from running up there, I pound on Lizzie's apartment door. No answer. I use my key to open it and stick my head inside. Lizzie! She still doesn't answer. I hear the sink running in the hall bathroom. Lizzie! I call loudly through the closed bathroom door. Just a second, she calls back, sounding annoyed. Oh, all right, come in. I push the door to find her in front of the mirror, holding a dripping towel to her eye. What's wrong? I asked hurriedly. If you must know, she says, pulling the towel away to reveal a very red eye. I poked myself in the eye. With what? I ask, searching the room for any sharp sticks. She mumbles an answer, but I can't hear. What did you say? She groans and repeats. I poked myself with eyeliner. What's an eyeliner? Hey, she says, noticing for the first time that I'm standing on the bath mat. No shoes in here. Why not? She stares at me with her one good eye. What if you stepped on a worm when you were outside? Then you came in here and stood on my bath mat? Worm parts would get on it, and then I'd come out of the shower and step on worm guts in my bare feet. Is that what you want? Is it? I slowly back into the hall. It is best not to answer when she's in moods like this. You better hurry, I warn her. James is waiting outside. I don't want to be late on our second day. She sighs loudly and puts down the towel. Does it look really bad? I shake my head, even though it does look pretty bad. No one will even notice. Lizzie looks doubtful, but then follows me out of the bathroom after one last glance in the mirror. While she puts her shoes on, I hurry downstairs and tell James what happened. Women and their makeup, he says knowingly, shaking his head. Do you think men notice if their eyes are lined or their cheeks are pink? 
Lizzie doesn't wear makeup, I inform her. She does now, a girl's voice says from behind me. It's Samantha, the new girl. How do you know? I ask. She is too busy pressing her face against the limo's window to answer me. I glance around but don't see any signs of her evil twin. The front door of the building bangs open and Lizzie runs down the stairs. She ignores me and James and quickly pulls her hair in front of the red eye as Samantha turns around. Samantha looks from me to Lizzie and back again. Is this car for you guys? She asks incredulously. Are you like rich or something? Lizzie opens her mouth, but I quickly answer. Rich uncle. Without waiting for James to this time, I yank open the back limo door. Lizzie hurries ahead of me, her hair still hanging in her face. As James closes the door behind us, I hear Samantha call out, Wait! Who's uncle? That was a close one, Lizzie says, reaching into the fridge and grabbing one can of orange juice. Do you want to tell me what's going on? I ask, unwrapping my breakfast sandwich. It's nothing, she says with a shrug. Samantha came over for a little while last night. That's all. I stop mid-bite and rest the sandwich on my lap. Really? I ask, trying not to sound surprised or worse yet, jealous. Yes, really. Why is that so hard to believe? I quickly take a bite of my sandwich. Who can expect someone to answer with a mouthful of peanut butter? So what did you guys do? I ask when I'm done chewing. She shrugs. Girl stuff. You wouldn't have been interested. We're now on uncharted grounds. I change the subject. Did you read the letter from Miss Bingsley? She nods and asks, Who would name their kid Oswald Oswald? I know! I exclaim, and we both laugh. The tension in the car dissolves. By the time we pull up in front of Mr. Oswald's building, everything's back to normal. I don't want to ruin the mood by telling her what I learned about Bitsy Solomon. How does my eye look now? Lizzie asks as we climb out. You can't even tell anymore. I assure her. It is mostly true. Good, she says firmly, because I don't want anything to distract Mr. Oswald when I give him a piece of my mind. She storms past James and walks directly up to Mr. Oswald's door. Raising her fist, she's about to pound on the door when Mr. Oswald opens it. Lizzie barely stops short of hitting him. Whoa there, little lady, he says, backing up. You must be anxious to get started. Lizzie puts her hands on her hip and does her best glare. You've got a lot of explaining to do, mister. Oh my, he replies, unable to hide a smile. Let's go to my office and discuss whatever's bothering you on this beautiful summer day. As if you don't know, Lizzie snaps, storming into the house. I flash Mr. Oswald an embarrassed smile as I enter. I want answers as much as Lizzie does, but one can still be polite about it. As we pass through the box-filled living room, I inhale deeply. Someone is baking. Mary is waiting for us in the library with orange juice and chocolate crumb cake. If Mr. Oswald is trying to win us over, he's got my vote. I happily munch away while Lizzie waits impatiently for Mr. Oswald to get settled behind his desk. Everything went smoothly yesterday, I trust? Mr. Oswald asks. We do have some questions, like... I begin, but Lizzie cuts me off. Why didn't you tell us Miss Bingsley didn't know we were coming? She demands. Why did you tell us her book was about woodland animals? Why did your grandfather hold on to it for over 60 years? My father said that kids under 18 aren't allowed to pawn stuff. It's illegal. She lowers her voice a bit on illegal. But he answers Lizzie. He turns to me and asks, How about you, Jeremy? Do you have anything to add to that list? I am tempted to ask why someone would name their kid Oswald Oswald, but Ozzy was his grandfather, so it wouldn't be very respectful. I shake my head. Is every delivery going to be like that one? Lizzie asks. Miss Oswald shake Mr. Oswald shakes his head. Not exactly like that one, he says. Nothing is ever exactly like anything else. I apologize for not having the time to prepare you fully yesterday, and I hope you will forgive me and allow me to explain. Jeremy? Yes, okay. I say surprised and kind of flattered that he would ask my forgiveness. Lizzie? Mr. Oswald asks. Lizzie sighs loudly. <sighs> Whatever. Good. Mr. Oswald exclaims, pushing himself up from his leather chair. I'll explain by showing you another item. He walks over to his nearest row of shelves and reaches up for only an item on the top shelf. A brass telescope. Even on his tiptoes, he can't quite reach it. I suddenly have this horrible image of him falling and breaking a hip and having us pick up trash in Central Park. I bound out of my chair to offer to help. Hoisting myself up on the bottom, I reach for my telescope. I reach for the telescope. It's heavier than I would have thought, and my foot loses its grip on the shelf. Lizzie yelps as I start to tip over backward. Mr. Oswald moves faster than I would have thought possible and steadies me. Good thing you don't weigh much more, he says, clasping me on the shoulder. Sorry about that, I say reddening. I carefully hand him the telescope. Here I have been worrying about him falling, and instead I almost crush him. Are you okay? 
Lizzie whispers. I nod, embarrassed. Maybe I should take up weightlifting. Mr. Oswald places the telescope on the desk in front of us. This, he says proudly, is a Broadhurst. It was the most powerful telescope for backyard viewing in its day. Which was when, Lizzie asks. The 1930s, he replies. Isn't it a beauty? On a clear night, you could see the whole solar system with this one. Unable to stop myself, I blurt out, my very energetic, energetic mother just served as nine pizzas. Lizzie gawks at me like I have two heads. He's lost it. He's finally lost it. I knew the day would come. Mr. Oswald chuckles. Jeremy has given us a monomic device for remembering the order of our planets. Lizzie rolls her eyes. See, she says, I told you he reads too much. I believe one cannot read too much, Mr. Oswald says. Jeremy, your monomic device might have to change. I've been reading about Pluto perhaps losing its planethood. Astronomers think it's too small to fit the definition of a planet. I nod. I had read about that too. Figures they'd get rid of one named after Mickey Mouse's dog, Lizzie, Lizzie grumbles. I lean closer to the desk and check out the telescope. It is obviously very old because it is made of some kind of heavy metal like brass or copper instead of plastic. I have asked for, and been denied, a telescope for my birth day ever since I was eight. Mom argues that it is impractical because there are so many lights in the city that we can barely see the stars. This kid at school used to brag that his family owned me, but instead of aiming it at the sky, it was pointed at the apartment building across the street from his. After I heard that, I decided to keep my blinds closed in case we have some nosy neighbors as well. I reach out and run my finger down the slope of the telescope. Who has started? Who has stared through the viewfinder? What did they see? Where did you get it? I ask revertedly. In 1944, a young man named Amos Grady moved to Brooklyn from Canada, Kentucky. He brought this to my grandfather's shop. Granddad paid Amos $45 for it. That was a lot of money in those days. He should have turned it over to the government for scrap metal, but the reasons of his own he did not. Let me guess, Lizzie says. Today we're going to return this old telescope to Amos Grady, right? No, Mr. Oswald replies. He turns back to the shelves and picks up an ordnance stained glass lamp with a frayed brown cord. Today you're going to deliver this lamp to a Mr. Simon Rudolph on Avenue B. He places the lamp in Lizzie's surprised hands. She examines it. Does this thing even work? Mr. Oswald chuckles. I never thought to try it. Was Amos Grady under 18? Lizzie interrupts. 14 to the day, Mr. Oswald replies. Then what your grandfather did was illegal, she asks. I slide down in my chair, unsure where to look. Mr. Oswald nods. Oh, yes, quite. I knew it, Lizzie exclaims. I knew there was something suspicious going on here. Didn't I tell you, Jeremy? I slide farther down in my seat. My eyes are level with the top of my desk now. Mr. Oswald returns to his chair. He holds up his hand. Before you get the wrong idea, allow me to explain, as I promised earlier. Lizzie places the lamp on the desk next to the telescope and sits back, arms folded. When I'm sure she's not going to yell anymore, I slide back up in my chair. Mr. Oswald clears his throat. <coughs> Everyone in New York City knew my grandfather, old Ozzie. They called him even before he got old. Priests and rabbis and business leaders came to him for his sensible advice. Little children would follow him in the streets. He always had a piece of taffy or a pickle to give them. A pickle? I can't help interjecting. Kids would follow him for a pickle? Mr. Oswald smiles. For blocks and blocks. These pickles were aged to perfection in big wooden barrels down by the piers. Nothing like them back then, or since. I shudder involuntarily. Mr. Oswald continues. But more than pickles, the children knew they could come to my grandfather with their worries. And in those days the 1930s and 40s, there were a lot of worries to be had. Now, as Miss Molden, her rightly pointed out, it was, shall we say, frowned upon to accept an item in the pawn shop from a child. But, as I said, times were tough back then, and everyone had money problems, even children. So Ozzy, he pauses, pauses here and says, with me so far? We nod. I'm actually on the edge of my seat, even with the part about pickles. Ozzy told the kids he would buy what they offered on one condition. He made up a special form for them to fill out explaining where the item came from and why they needed to sell it. He would sit the kids down in the front of the typewriter and even if it took them all day, they recorded their stories. Ozzy never judged the children's reasons and he always paid a fair price. Having to fill out the form scared away all but most, the most resilient. But why didn't Ozzy turn around and sell these things to someone else, I ask? Isn't that how the pawn business works? 
Mr. Oswald nods. Indeed it is. But helping these youngsters out was never about the money. Ozzy stashed the items and the letters in a special closet in the back of his storeroom, and no one knew about them, not even my own father, who ran the store for thirty years. Do you think he meant to give them back to the kids? I inquire. I wish I knew, Mr. Oswald replies, glancing over at an old black and white photograph on his desk. I hadn't paid attention to the photo before, but now I lean in to examine. It shows a middle-aged man holding up a fish in a pole posing next to the wooden sign that reads, You should see the one that got away. Old Ozzy? I ask. Mr. Oswald nods. A big fisherman in his youth. But how do you find these people after so many years, Lizzie asks. I hired a good detective. With so much information on the internet, it's very difficult to find out more than we even wanted to know. Tell me about it, I mutter. They both turn to look at me. I pick up the lamp and say, So what's this guy's story? Mr. Oswald checks his watch. I didn't plan to spend so much time here in the morning. I don't have time to pack up the lamp. You can carry it, right? Without waiting for an answer, he reaches in his top drawer and pulls out an envelope. He holds it out to me. I am not surprised to see Simon Rudolph's name printed on it in the same neat handwriting as the other. I slide it in my back pocket. Before I can remind him, he still hasn't told us anything about Simon or the lamp. James appears and hands Mr. Oswald his pipe in a newspaper. I have the car ready for the children out front, sir, James says. Teenagers, Lizzie mutters under her breath. Practically, she adds. Good, good, Mr. Oswald says to James. He lifts a post-it note off the top of his desk and hands it to him. There is no house number outside Mr. Rudolph's door, he warns us all. Mr. Rudolph's a bit, shall we say, eccentric? Bring your notebooks to our next visit. I'll be out of town for the next two days, so I will see you on Friday. Thank you in advance for a job well done. Mr. Oswald leaves the room and James follows. Lizzie and I are alone. Neither of us make a move to take the lamp. Uh, I guess we should go too. I suggest. This is just like last time, she grumbles. But she picks up the lamp. We don't know anything about this guy. We don't know what to expect. As we head toward the front door, I whisper, This isn't exactly like last time. I know, I know, Lizzie replies, and then poorly mimics Mr. Oswald's voice. Because nothing is ever exactly like anything else. No, I mean, this time, we know what the envelope is for. Lizzie stops walking and stares at me. Did I just hear what I think I heard? Is the Honorable Jeremy Fink suggesting we open the envelope before we get there? He might be, I say with a proud smile. There's hope for you yet, she says approvingly. I'm glad she's pleased by my willingness to break the rules, even though Mr. Oswald didn't specifically tell us not to read it. But honestly, I'm motivated less by curiosity and more by fear. I don't like being unprepared for anything, and if Mr. Rudolph is as eccentric as Mr. Oswald said, I want to know exactly what we're walking into.